Welcome, everybody. It's not working. <laughs> um, oh, it's really not. <laughs> yeah. So, hello, everybody. First of all, thanks you. Thank you all for coming. It's great to be here, and it's an awesome conference so far. And we are really happy to be here. This is Gernot. And this is my handsome colleague, Sebastian. <laughs> OK. Um, we are both organizing the Angular Meetup in Berlin. So if you're ever in Berlin, uh, feel free to check by. And also, if you want to talk in Berlin, feel free to reach out to us. We are glad and happy to have speakers here. Today, we're going to talk about design patterns for large Angular applications that actually scale. And we both work for small improvements at a large Angular application. Small improvements is a tool for feedback um, performance review, goal planning, and um, continuous um, feedback. Our app grew heavily over the last three years, um, and especially we have powerful administrator screens that make our code base really huge. So um, let's, let me tell you our story. So in the beginning, there was void and darkness, and then we started to add code. A little bit of a code, and we added more and more features, and our app keep, kept growing. So in the beginning, it was pretty easy to add functionality. Our code base grow, and so on. Um, and if we, we will now look at this graph, this really scientific graph, by the way, um, we could say that our effort for adding new features uh, increased, while our scalability kind of decreased. Especially when we were adding more features, changing features, um, business requirements change, and so on. But guess that's not big news to you, because we are in software development. That's a problem we have all day. Um, so another thing is that we, our team also grow. Um, so and this also has a significant impact on the code base, because suddenly people um, add code you don't understand anymore, and they don't understand your code, and so on. So this is also um, increasing effort of adding new features while decreasing our scalability. <clears throat> so in mid-2014, our scalability was kind of tending to the bottom of this, uh, the bottom of this slide. So, and we were about to double our team size in one month. And that's exactly the point where we asked ourselves, this is not going to be any better, right? And we committed ourselves to the, to the goal of um, finding the holy grail of uh, scaling front-end applications. Um, so we did step back and analyzed our code base. It wasn't that bad at all, um, since we followed most of the best practices, and we also learned from our faults, which helped us a lot. We managed to get out of the bad state of having a scope soup, which every Angular application kind of starts with. If you're not familiar with scope soup and so on, um, feel free to check out a, a talk by Tero Pravienen, who also gave a, a talk, lighting talk yesterday. And he was at a meetup in Berlin. And he basically explains how to get out of the scope soup to a really component-based um, architecture. So this, ar this component-based architecture we had already. And I'm going to ask Gernot now to explain us to this a little bit more. Thank you. So. Let's define a little bit what components are. Components take inputs and outputs. They have clearly defined boundaries through this interface. They are basically shielded away from the outside world and the rest of your application, because really, they take all that data in, and they have probably callbacks that then communicate to the outside world. This is a good approach, but how does this actually look in a real world application? you will probably have a quite a big component tree at some point. And there are two main questions that arise here. How to share functionality between these components and how to give these components some kind of context? How do they know about the rest of the application? Let's look at sharing functionality first. In this scope tree, the two blue highlighted components will need to do kind of the same thing. Let's imagine, imagine some kind of made-up 
UI for this. On the left side, we have some kind of message list, which is rendering message items. And within this message item, an author is displayed, for example. And by clicking on this author name, you also want to trigger a filter so that the message list is really triggering only messages that were written by this one author. On the right side of your screen, you might have a distinct filter panel. And within this filter panel, there's also this kind of author filter waiting to trigger a filtering of the list. If we look at this in the component tree again, we see that they are on different parts of the component tree. They are in some kind of sibling state. And the question is now really, how can they share code? They can't really. The logic needs to stream upwards. You cannot encapsulate the filter logic in one of these components because the data that, that is needed for this filtering operation is really owned, in this case, by the controller already. So all logic streams upwards. All logic streams to a common ancestor, which means that you end up with a pretty fat controller. I also mentioned the problem about really sharing context. For this, we will look at another subtree in this component tree. So our goal is really to delete a message of this list now. At the bottom of this subtree, you see a delete button. It's just some kind of generic delete button that, that contains specific styling and similar things. It's a button we also want to use elsewhere in the application where in parts that are not really connected to messages. If we now want to give this delete button the, the functionality to delete a message, we need to pass this function through the whole component tree. The owner of this function is again the controller. It needs to pass it to the message list, to the message item, to the delete button, so that the delete button can actually trigger the user interaction. You click something, a message gets deleted. The delete message function in this case is giving context. The function itself is encapsulating all the context of this particular part of your application. Within the delete message function, you will have references to other messages, for example, or to any other side effects this might trigger. For example, if we take the filtering example, after deleting a message, some kind of free filtering might have to happen. It's really this one function that provides the context and that needs to be passed down through the whole tree. If we look at this in code, we see that this is already a little problematic. This might be the controller template for this kind of mini application we have here. And we see that the message list needs to get a reference to this on delete message uh, function, sorry. The message list itself needs to pass this function to the message item. We again have an on delete callback defined here. When finally the message item can pass it on to the delete button. We see that all these components had to define a specific interface to handle this delete message function. Even if, like the message list, they were not really interested in the operation themselves. The only reason for them to define this interface was so that they can pass it on. If a component tree gets larger, this is not necessarily going to get easier. The problem is that we are kind of violating the input-output rule here. We are polluting these components by giving them things they are not directly interested in. This might lead to a problem when you want to move functionality around, for example. Let's say this blue component um, has some kind of functionality and we now want the green component to do the same thing. We want really to move functionality from one component to the other. You would think it's an operation that takes, takes you to work on two files, two components, but it's not the case. You have to touch all of your componentry, basically. You touch at least 10 different components and this is just not really perfect. Such isolated components are great in theory. You want to have, them in, to have inputs for them and outputs, but nothing more. The problem is that this component-driven approach doesn't really answer how to connect these components with each other. Sebastian will now show you how we tackle this problem in our application at small improvements. Yes. So, thank you, Gernot. Um, 
And when you have a problem, it's always good to start with asking a question. So let's all ask ourselves, what do we want, actually? And one of the problems we saw is that the dependence of our view components to each other is kind of decreasing our um, availability to add functionality to different components. We have this common ancestor problem and so on. So I would say one thing we really want is to be independent of the DOM structure so that we are able to change and reuse our UI components easily as we want. Um, and that's exactly the first thing that we want to do. Second is that we want to separate our UI components from our business logic. That means um, that we have a distinguished place where the business logic lives and we can easily change the business logic without having to touch the UI layer. For instance, imagine your backend um, decides to send you push notifications suddenly. And you are like, okay, wow, now I have to extend all my components. They have to update themselves. How do I do that? And it's all spread out in my component tree. If we centralize this in a specific place, we can just simply add um, this push, push notification to our business logic. And um, if we look at that, the component-driven approach was almost um, reaching that goal for us. So the missing step is really to get rid of the dependencies. And we achieve that by splitting the components into one component that needs to interact with the business layer or the business logic and the other component that doesn't. And that's why we will now talk about smart and dumb components. Um, smart and dumb components is a concept recently also mentioned by Dan Abramov in a blog post. And let's define what are smart and dumb components and what are the different responsibilities between these two? We could also call that the levels of awareness to our business logic these components have. Um, first, the dumb component. Dumb component is really just getting only our UI-specific um, actions. So it's, for instance, a button or a form. Um, we also have bound inputs and bound outputs. So a really clear interface to that component. It keeps and mutates only its internal state, so we can place it anywhere in the application. It has no knowledge of the outside world, so it's really reusable. And when you think about Angular 1, it basically also means that we have no service interaction. So um, we only have inputs and outputs, bound methods, and bound binded attributes, basically. It might inject some helpers, but um, nothing else. And it receives, of course, callbacks and bindings via um, properties. Next, the smart component is wrapping one or more dumb components and connects them with our business logic. So its main purpose is to separate the dumb components, or our UI, from our business layer. Um, yeah, there's the business layer. That is um, achieved by providing context to the dumb components. So it will get the context out of the business logic and pass it down to our dumb components. It also provides the callbacks for the dumb components to interact with the business logic. So for instance, taking user interaction and giving them to our business logic layer. Speaking in the Angular 1 um, world, we would say that inject services and gets the context out of services and also calls services to pass actions. Um, let's see how the smart component tree would look like. We basically have couples of smart and dumb components everywhere placed in our UI, and they are now easily ex exchangeable. We could just move around the logic, and if we need to add functionality, for instance, the delete um, Gernot mentioned, we will just add it to the smart component include a dumb component, wire it together, and be done with it. So let's take a look at our example app. In this case, we want to filter our messages by an author. We have on the right a filter panel, and on the left our messages list, and a user wants to click either in the message on the author to filter the message list, or on the filter panel. Um, how does this look in code? Um, first. Let's take a look at the message list. 
It's basically just repeating over a list of messages. And as you see, the message item, our smart component, is receiving the context from this Andrew repeat in this case. How does the message item smart component template look like? We have um, all the dumb components um, that are displaying our message. In this case, we have the message content uh, dumb component. We have a delete button, and we have our property filter. And the green thing is that we pass <laughs> the green thing. Yeah, um, we pass the context um, as you see the green arrows there, and we have the property filter that has an on-filter callback, for instance. So this is actually the interface that we implement from our smart component. Um, let's look at the JavaScript code for a sec. On the um, top side, we have bind to controller. Our message context is bound to our controller. Then we have our controller definition, um, which injects some services, which I will talk about in a minute. So let's just go down a bit. And there, actually, you find the interface to our dumb components and the business logic. We are providing the filter messages method to our view model. VM stands for view model here. And we are invoking just a message filter service to filter some messages. Further down, you have the delete message interface, which will, um, in this case, trigger a delete message action. Um, so here we see clearly, clearly the interface between smart smart components, dumb components, and the business layer. Um, so, next. How do we actually connect these smart components with the business logic? I promised you to speak about the injections we had in our controller. And let's trace that from a more practical approach. So, we want to execute now this, business, uh, this delete action that Gernot just said. So, our user will click on the delete button here. Um, it will invoke our message item smart component. And our message item smart component, as you saw in the example uh, just a couple of seconds ago, will um, invoke our delete message action. The delete message action is basically the prime thing that couples our business logic. So it will contain all side effects. For instance, it will handle a request to the, to the API and say, hey, I want to delete this uh, message. Then we will wait for, for the response of the server. And if this um, succeeds, we want to do something else. What else do we want to do? We want to update our state, our application state, in this case, that a message is now deleted. Um, how does this look in code? It's fairly simple, straightforward. Our message delete action has a method, delete message, couples all the side effects, in this case, just using the message resource to delete something, and then we see we want to notify our state layer. Um, this state layer then does all the state manipulations. It will be responsible to um, bundle all state mutations there. And our state layer will notify or throw an event and say, hey, the change has um, something has happened to my data, to my um, state. And this will look in code it's pretty um, straightforward as well. We will delete our internal, uh, the message from our internal state representation. In this case, it's just a map, a ID best hash map, um, where we'll delete the message from. And then we trigger the delete event. And what does this event help us to do? It basically helps us to decentralize um, the state updates. That means smart components can now listen to this event and implement custom handler logic. That way we don't have to have a controller which is executing imperatively update this one, update that one, reset the filter, and so on. So it's really easy to, to add functionality because the smart components um, can implement their custom handler logic. Um, so, as you see here, we have we listen on the events um, in our message, message list or in our filter panel. panel. Um, so we saw that now from a really practical approach, and I will ask Gernot now on stage again to formalize this concept a bit more so we can maybe reapply it to some different use cases. 
So if we look at this from a more conceptual perspective, this is of course a unidirectional data flow system. You might all know this already. It's heavily inspired by what Facebook is doing right now with their flow pattern they, um, ah, sorry, flux pattern they were proposing. The interesting thing is that these two layers we display here, one state layer that is responsible to hold your application state and to trigger change events. And this action layer can totally be the core of your application. How you implement this is up for grabs, I would say. There are several options. What Sebastian just showed you was an approach that used several store-like custom services. It's, it's just one approach. It might not even be the best one. I would probably refactor it in our own app right now, but it doesn't really matter. Important is that you have these two parts. You have one layer that is triggering the change notifications and another that is triggering that a stage change actually happens. You might implement a single globalized store for this, like, or in, even using the reducer pattern, um, like in the very popular Redux framework. But also a router-based solution could be thought of. An action would just trigger a state change, a URL change. The state is in fact then held and encapsulated in the URL, and listeners could then go on and listen to this URL change and do whatever they need to do. Yesterday we heard a talk about reactive streams. Today about Meteor. This is something that could all live on this left side of this diagram. Ideally, you shield this away from the rest of your application because then you can switch technologies here more easily and always have a clean and stable interface running. You see, we haven't really seen any kind of view here so far. And this is also great. You can bundle your business logic like that in a way that is completely independent of your view. You can test it in isolation and separate your concerns much better. The view is in fact hooked in by smart and dumb components as Sebastian said. The interesting thing is really that the smart components define how this interaction works. You have a clearly defined place on where to wire your view layer to the rest of your business logic. This might be done in Angular 1. The interesting thing is to follow these patterns here, because when you follow these patterns, you might be in a position to switch technologies on a view layer as well at some point and use React or Angular 2. It's not for free, of course. You have to do something and have to work hard to really migrate your application like that. But when you follow such a concept, you at least can do it in some kind of methodology, metho, word missing, systematic way. <laughs> <laughs> because you just know what to expect from your components. The dumb components take input outputs. The smart components wire it into the rest of your application. You can follow methods and patterns to really do your refactoring and your technological change even. Let's start to summarize this a bit because we're almost running out of time. We have here four different concepts at hand. A state layer which holds your application state and is responsible for firing change notifications to the rest of the system. Smart components that wire business and view layer together. They are really the ones that provide context for your view, for your dumb components who just take inputs and outputs and represent the actual user interface where the user interacts with your application. They are pure and highly reusable. And actions, actions that bundle all side effects and trigger state changes so that the loop is closed and from the top you can start with change notifications again and update your system. If you want to forget anything about this talk, there are a couple of things I want you to remember. So smart, the combo of smart and dumb components is very, very useful because they make your UI highly flexible. When you add a unidirectional data flow, 
you get in a spot where it's very easy to separate concerns. So Brad in the keynote mentioned yesterday unidirectional data flows, mostly in the sense of performance. It's not about performance only. It's really about designing and architecturing your application. Because when you combine these two approaches with each other, you reach a very clean and predictable, predictable architecture that actually scales. No matter it's, whether it's team growth or really technological change you have to face over the years. That's it from us. I'm Gernot, this is Sebastian. And we will be available for question answering in the Ask Me Anything room number one. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. <laughs>